Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Accessible Content and Inclusive Curriculums. My name is Tom Langston, and I'll pass you over to Catherine to do the legwork for this one. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. If we haven't met, I'm Catherine Murgatroyd, relatively new appointment in ACDEV. Um, I'm delighted to be taking this session today on inclusive curriculums and accessible content. Um, the aims for today's session are... Oh, I'm pressing my enter button and nothing's happening. We're going to understand how the um, how Blackboard Ally functions and learn how to use Ally to check the accessibility for Moodle content. And that will be at the end with Tom. And prior to that, we're going to have a look at the roots of awarding gaps um, and the limitations of colonial curriculums and think about some questions that we can develop to support enhancements to our curriculum in the real short term. Um, and decolonizing our curriculum, as I'm sure you've heard, is a, a, a longer term, holistic, very large institutional project which we're due to be kicking off shortly and this is kind of some short-term considerations to get us all in the mindset so before we start um, I just wanted to kind of make a bit of a disclaimer really which is that throughout this session I'll be using the terms BME um, and also the term white but I understand that those terms are problematic they may be the norm sector wide but they're not without their challenges um, the the term BME is a homogenous term, really incapable of capturing the multitude of experiences and cultures that it attempts to represent. Um, there are other terms that people use, for example, people of colour, but actually that's problematic too, because what tends to happen is white people refer to anyone who is not white as a person of colour, when actually we are all um, people of colour. Um, and I'm, I'm using the term white today to separate whiteness because I think it's really important at this point in history that we recognise the inherent privilege of being white. So I'm going to be using white and BME, but I wouldn't want you to think that actually I don't understand there are limitations in those terms. And I certainly don't believe that all BME staff, students or members of the community have the same experiences or feelings or, or understandings. There you go. Um, we're going to start off, I'm get, I've got a few PowerPoint slides and a couple of interactive elements, but really I'm hoping to kind of promote discussion and dialogue with food for thought. But we're starting off with a hard truth, really, which is across the sector and at our university, we do have a racialised awarding gap. Um, and so for the academic year 1819, the gap between white and black students was, if I move my chat, 22%. Um, and the Office for Students are really clear that actually black and minority ethnic students are being educated in institutions that reinforce white privilege and class privilege. And as I said, you know, it requires a longer term holistic intervention, but thinking about it now and making some changes now can really start to make a difference. And, you know, I'm sure you'll agree that we can't really wait. I'm not a historian. But we need to briefly go back in time and kind of visit the roots of um, colonialism in order to really understand where we are today and to hopefully inform our values moving forward. Um, and to do that, we've got to think about colonialism, imperialism and axiology briefly. Um, and colonialism, the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. Um, and an example of that will be British Empire in India. Imperialism is a kind of extension of colonialism, a policy lending a country's power and influence through colonisation, often with the use of military force. And when we think of imperialism, we often think of the Romans and how they kind of colonised and grew and grew and expanded and expanded. And then importantly, axiology, which is the study of the nature of value and the valuation of things that are valuable. And that's very important because what certainly British colonies and Western colonies did was colonise other nations and indigenous populations and claim for themselves and describe what they felt was of value. OK, and throughout colonisation, what we have seen, sadly, is the misuse of education. So we know that Western nations and Western colonies used edu education as a tool to kind of reinforce culturally the 
colonial policies aimed at achieving economically and politically. So we've taken financial control of a country, we've taken political control of a country, but now we need to control the people, we need to form an alliance with the populations in order to prevent rebellion. So it was kind of this creation of a homogenous cultural space through the use of education uh, of natives that enabled continued persuasion, coercion and exploitation. And sadly for us, we've got to come to terms with and accept the exploitative nature uh, of the Western Empire and the British Empire, because it, it's that recognition that really precedes the work that needs to be done. OK, so we, we may all agree today we have colonial curriculums. The education we receive here is predominantly shaped by colonialism with a prominence of white Eurocentric scholars and thinkers. And it's important to remember that the dividend of, of the British Empire and empire weren't just spices and gold and tea and silk, but actually knowledge, knowledge that we took, knowledge that we claimed, knowledge that f flowed back to the imperial centres. Um, and this knowledge was really crucial for Western development and growth. But what we did is we, we professionalised it as Western science, often at the expense of other indigenous, but really claiming it for our own. So what we're arguing today, um, quite effectively, I think, is that colonial curriculums are unrepresentative because they selectively construct teachings that exclude crucial narratives. They're inaccessible in the sense that they prevent all students from identifying with the narratives construed, that they're exclusive um, and they're privileged and that they perpetuate advantaged participation and progression of select students and they tend to be white mainstream students. Um, and we can give some examples here. There are examples in all of our disciplines, and um, this is um, kind of entrenched in the foundations of our knowledge empire. But a couple of examples, philosophy and religious teachings, they're often dominated by white male Eurocentric perspectives. Often English literature centres around white writings. And what we see is that our BME students find themselves unrepresented and their histories and experiences and cultures erased. And I sometimes think about um, somebody coming along and setting fire to your house and looting it of all of its possessions. And you're there as the homeowner and you've had your house burnt down and your possessions stolen from you. And there are some neighbours, members in your community who are very distressed about what's happening to you. And they call the police and they call the fire brigade and the police come. I mean, it's a complex investigation for them to manage and the fire brigade come and it's high risk for them because they've got to grapple with a fire and put the fire out. And the only version of that story that is told to the rest of the world and repeated is the narrative account of the person who set the fire and looted you and they thought it was fantastic they thought it was a fantastic fire they'd use the right accelerant or, or you know whatever you need to do to start a good fire and they were able to claim from your house everything that they needed to support their development and move on and in a way I think that kind of metaphor for me um, helps me really understand what our curriculums are and, and really the accounts of, you know, indigenous natives that are that are missing and, and the exploitation, as I've said, that is inherent. So we know that much valuable, credible knowledge is dismissed. BME perspectives and other marginalised perspectives are often drowned in whiteness and the history in history, the lives of those populations who were colonised are overlooked for the perspective of British business. So our task is decolonising the knowledge economy as a whole globally and all of the disciplines and domains within it. And, and so our task is to do that within our institution. But what's really important is if we want to prepare our students for a global and diverse world, our curriculums need to adapt so that our students perspective of history and we must make issues of social justice explicit in everything that we do um, and I recently did a piece of work with some colleagues who were running or writing a plant-based nutrition 
degree and they said how on earth are we going to get plant-based nutrition into our degree because what we want to talk about is activity at a cellular le cellular level after consuming plants we want to talk about the power of healing and growth from plant-based diets we want to critique other diets um, and we really want to kind of champion plant power but by the end of um, this piece of work actually we, we had a degree program that was integrated from the start a social justice perspective so whether that was links between poverty and food choice um, whether that was links between um, agriculture and how that disproportionately can affect underdeveloped countries the exploitation of workers for example i don't know growing cocoa and even even things like the the kind of prominence of the avocado as the wonderful superfood for westernized liberal hipsters for their avo on toast but the significant social justice and ethical challenges around that for indigenous populations for example in chile where whole villages are having their water supplies diverted um, in order to fuel the western desire for an avocado and individuals are having kind of a very small amount of water rationed and delivered to them daily so none of our none of our programs operate in a vacuum none of them are distant from social justice and actually it's that link that we need to make so that our programs are excellent in terms of their discipline and that social justice is prominent so not surprisingly since 2015 uk heis have been preparing to overhaul curriculum through the lens of decolonization. Now, there is a lovely Padlet here, which would be fantastic if everybody could add to it. Tom, I'm just gonna try and do something a bit more technical than I like, which is copy and paste this link here into the chat so that participants today can add to this Padlet with any thoughts they have about what is decolonisation, any understandings and sharing ideas of great things that um, I'm sure everybody is doing. Let's hope this goes in all right. Ta-da! Fantastic. So if everybody would like to contribute to this Padlet with their thoughts, questions, challenges or areas of good practice, it'd be absolutely fantastic. And I'm just going to stroll. <laughs> Tom, if you think I'm making any errors here, tech in terms of technology, you're all good. Hurrah! Do let me know. <laughs> you may right. you flick between the two slides. Remember to refresh the content. I, I, I oh know yes. Not... Oh, that's it. Great. Again, if you run the presentation full screen, you'll get the the chat that the, the Padlet much larger as well. Sorry, say that again. If you make your, if you share the the, like play the play from that current slide, mm -hmm. so we're not we're currently not seeing the presentation. We're seeing the, the there we go. So again, flick between the the, the slides, uh, and we should sort of see more as we go through as it gets added. Do do has any. Yeah, I don't, I th I'm getting a little notification to say that um, there's contributions to the Padlet, but then I'm not seeing it. Perhaps if this Padlet is not um, working, if anybody wanted to put their comments in the chat. They, they are coming in. Uh, I think it's just the, the refresh rate onto the the PowerPoint version of it. Uh, can you click the three dots at the top? Does that allow a refresh option within the Padlet itself? So on the screen, you've got the sign up, login, share, and three dots. Yeah. Can you click on that? I've clicked on the three dots. I've got notes, manage panels, copy link, health checker view, audio, uh, microphone, speaker. No, that not that's not the Padlet. You've done the three dots within WebEx. I mean, on the actual PowerPoint itself. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, there you go. There's more to come in now, but the three, oh, yeah. dots, the three dots on the Padlet. Oh. Does that have a refresh option in there? 
No. Oh, this is terribly. <laughs> Oh, I've got to log in, Tom. Oh, that's just gone and thrown in for a loop, hasn't it? That, yes, that's very unfortunate, isn't it? Uh, oh, just if you copy sorry about my pattern of disaster. Well, do you want me to read the ones that I can see coming in? Yes, brilliant. Read them. I can do that. I can read. Uh, the removal of all historic and colonised, and that hasn't finished typing yet. Um, Encouraging students to share their experience and their identity, acknowledging students' lived experience. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's moving around very fast. I also remember that I took a group of students to a farm attraction, something coming in there. Uh, be aware of not perpetuating the myth of the white male white academic in my research. I added photos of major contributors to an academic poster and was shocked by the male whiteness and will endeavor to seek, to seek other voices to be heard. Brilliant. Um, allowing students to sufficiently express their own personal appearance, appearance, opinions and experiences, particularly cultural differences. I used to teach rural tourism to students who never visited the countryside, so I had to explore the impact of this on visitor strategies, marketing, etc. I assume this is decolonizing. Um, yeah, I mean, that definitely sounds like social justice to me. And, you know, there, there's a large body of knowledge that talks about the ethics of tourism and how really unethical tourism actually can be. Uh, as, as I think a follow on from that post as well, where uh, when they went to the farm, a group of inner city London students had never seen a cow before. And it was a shock to realise where milk came from. Wow. Um, uh, where, but not specifically building in, apart from my subject philosophy. Um, listening to other voices uh, from previously, there was about feminism in architecture as well. Obviously, a very male white history of, of, of designers and, and, and producers of that kind of content. Um, experiencing more sexism within teaching and the, and the classroom potentially, I, I hasn't finished typing that one, in education in general, sorry. Yeah, fantastic. I think the, the overriding theme really is diversifying our scholarly content, diversifying our contributors and our thinkers, our authors, so that students are able to get a much more balanced, broader perspective from much more cultural diversity and also see themselves reflected in the material that they're engaging with. So they're not just engaging with older white men. Yeah, westernised white men. So Keele University have a nice definition of, of, of decolonisation as part of their manifesto. And, and they describe it as creating spaces and resources for a dialogue among all members of the university. Um, and, and that's about how to imagine and envisage all cultures and knowledge systems in the curriculum um, and with respect to what is being taught and how it frames the world. If you can hear banging, I'm ever so sorry, I've got a builder banging right underneath me in a room below, which is very unfortunate. OK, um, here's an example from sociology uh, from a, a SAGE journal, and they say decolonizing sociology involves a recognition of exploitative and excluded sociological knowledges, a reassessment of who and what counts as canonical within sociology, and a reimagining for what constitutes sociological thought in the first place. Yes. Oh, thank you, Andy. Being able to see themselves in the materials being presented, yes. And that's, you know, so really important. They want, if you want to promote belonging among students, the community and the content and the teaching has to be available for everybody to see themselves being reflected within it. So we may agree inclusive curriculum design. Um, inclusive curriculums have contents that cover multiple perspectives, 
theoretical, multiple theoretical standpoints and use contributions from multiple cultures and backgrounds. Um, and inclusive content facilitates exploration of themes of social justice, including equality, diversity, inclusivity and relativity. And as somebody rightly said in the Padlet, enable students to consider their own identity in relation to other people, their own beliefs, cultural assumptions and unconscious bias. Now we've got another Padlet here, so I'm hoping that this is going to work because this is about sharing your ideas of how you're getting social justice into your programmes or what you're doing already, what you're thinking about or what you might do or any tips that you would give your colleagues. So let's see what we can do. Tom, um, you might have to just read them if that's all right. So are you running a nutrition program and you're very critical of the avocado or the um, kind of cocoa trade or, or what's springing to mind when you're thinking about social justice in your programs? Is there anything in your programs that you think is transferable to to multiple programs? Um, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Just uh, I've recopied the link in as you don't need the question mark. Thank you. So. Uh, I've added that in now and as they come in, I will. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> oh, yes, I didn't copy the full link. Um, I was in the session earlier today for half of it about using Padlet and I will be watching the recording and making excessive notes. So I just want to re reassure any viewers that next time you see me, I'll be a Padlet Pro. What is what is good about this is I can see it coming through live here. The trouble is it's knowing when to stop start reading the, the post when they people have finished what they're saying. Yeah, sure. Uh, so one that's just coming in, micro teaching sessions, getting students to design and deliver their own sessions. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, there's no greater way, I guess, than hearing the student's voice and the student perspective than getting them to design teaching themselves. We had some comments um, earlier in the week about the the kind of dominance. If if we say heteronormative white male Western scholars, somebody said, well, actually, that's all the classics in, in my programme. All of the classics that we need students to engage with are are um, white Westernised heteronormative kind of males. And maybe it's about allowing criticality, using criticality to scaffold onto the, the kind of foundation of the classics highlighting to students what they're seeing in terms of the profile on their programs and using extension activities to support students to engage in a, a much broader range of materials. I mean really I think there will come a time when we're rewriting our curriculums from scratch to really think critically about this um, but in the short term in terms of rigour and stretch and criticality, I think handing this job over to students and getting them to think about what they're seeing is a is a, a really quick win, really. So uh, a few more comments for you, Catherine. Yeah. Ensuring our, uh, oh, it's moved. Ensuring our nurses not only consider their own voices, but the voices of their clients they will be meeting out in the community. Brilliant. Um, and the marketing workshops, putting students in the shoes of different cultural groups and get them to appreciate how they might be accepted uh, or viewed. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. I, I used to run a session. Oh, oh gosh. When I put my phone on silent, it um, torches so like ringing through my computer. Um, we used to run all these Apple things are too clever. Sorry? All these Apple products are too clever. God, very annoying. <laughs> Um, we used to run a session with um, students in the institution where I've just come from, where we used to ask students to um, present about the education system from the country in which they um, were born or the country in which they originate. And we had a really high percentage of um, 
English as a special language and um, second language students. And what that did was it enabled students to understand what how English academia works and the expectations in terms of study um, Moments, but it also enables students to understand each other and the perspectives they're from. And I had a black student say to me, what you need to understand, Catherine, is that your people came to our country and you told us we had to learn like this. They described it as a chew and poor model, um, which basically means remember and give back. So commit things to memory and write them down for the assignments. And that was the education system that you gave us 200 years ago. And we've been doing that ever since. And now we come to the UK and we are being pulled up for plagiarism. We are getting low marks because we're not autonomous and we don't understand criticality. And that was a kind of real eye opener for me in terms of the history of our legacy um, and, and how it either advantages or disadvantages some students. So that activity where students were to think about the education systems that they've been in and present to their peers in terms of what the models of learning were like, what the expectations were, what was required of them in terms of their skills as a learner was really, really fruitful. What else you got, Tom? Uh, I have hospitality management programmes have about 18 different nationalities and each year the students give a presentation to each other about their cultural uh, identity and behaviour so everyone can appreciate their lives and understand their behaviour, etc. I learn so much every year and understand the students better um, on that one. Another one from Andrew, field work, always moved, field work and bringing industry professionals, get students exposed to the real world and confident to engage in dialogue with all different types of groups. Uh, I think that's uh, about it at the moment. If um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure I said this before, but the work that is going on in the university, um, it, it sounds so, so, so positive. And actually, trying to map everything that's going on um, would be a really good start for us. Well, definitely for me for having a really good understanding there's just so many great pockets of work popping up in the classroom within departments within schools um it's fantastic right so can we diversify further about the content that we're delivering what is the demographic profile of authors on our programs what is the effect of this on the diversity of views with which students are presented. Could we reorganise material in the syllabus to bring different issues to prominence or using scaffolding um, to integrate various times of critical perspectives in relation to earlier sessions? So could we be saying later into the module, let's have a look at the materials that we've been looking at. What are we noticing about this? What perspectives are missing? What does this tell us about our disciplines? What does this tell us about equality and diversity? What does this tell us about social justice? <laughs> So I've just seen in the chat that Jim said, sorry, I was being a white male. I think they do call that mansplaining, Jim. I've, I've seen many videos on mansplaining, but I don't mind because we're all a product of our socialisation. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're forgiven. You really are. <laughs> that, 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 for me, Catherine is very forgiving, so. Somebody who makes as many mistakes as me uh, is never in a position to be um, annoyed at anybody else. Trust me. <laughs> Definitely not Jim, that's for sure. Right. Questioning our course's history. So is my subject contextualised in its historical moment, making explicit the kinds of research programmes, assumptions and aspirations that generated it? And I know in my early career as a social work lecturer, um, despite its real commitment to social justice and kind of human rights um, and equality are, are integral in the values of that profession, as in many professions, hopefully, um, we didn't really we didn't teach our students about the history and development of social work. We didn't really talk about social work and humanitarian aid. We didn't really teach our students about global crisis and what role our profession has in either colluding with um, an unequal status quo or reinforcing inequality or what role it should have in kind of social justice 
moving forward we very much were teaching in the earlier days a kind of here and now these are the skills you need these are the theories that inform your understanding and these are the things that you must do okay so mia language and identity in post-colonial era are explored in looking at the perspective of the other yep in the cultural experience of the year abroad for students of languages excellent yeah that's brilliant so students have a year ab abroad and they are learning about othering. Um, I, I've come across concepts of othering in kind of academic literature and in sociology, and I'm, I'm gathering that that's a generic term that is talking about the marginalization of certain groups or the othering of individuals in all disciplines. Is that right, Samir? Am I making sense yes. of that correctly? You can hear me. Oh. oh, I can hear yeah. you. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. To what extent does my module or course allow students to understand the origins and purposes of the field of study in its historical context? And could such an understanding, if absent, be introduced into core or introductory material? If our disciplines are built upon the exploitation of other communities, to what extent do our students know? To what extent? Question here, how would you challenge current demographics of the profession? Sadly, our cohorts tend to be made up of white females, which as a result has led to a polarised view and delivery. Yeah, I mean, I, I come from a profession as well um, that is dominated by females. It's a caring profession, it's social work. And we would definitely integrate gender equality in, into our um, curriculums and so we would be thinking about kind of gender pay gaps and the meteoric rise often of males who enter predominantly female professions um, in my experiences it, it, when males tend to enter professions such as social work that very quickly they're in management positions I'm sorry um, I'm not sure what your first name is Joe <laughs> thank you Joe Yes, so um, is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? Because then experts from the discipline are then entering into HE um, to deliver content and you ha then have a team of kind of female lecturers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? All white female lecturers. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I wonder if when if just highlighting this to students, allowing them to identify gaps and c to consider male perspectives um, it is a really good starting point, even if structurally we can't in the short term change a kind of biased demographic of who is actually in that profession. In the short term, we can be kind of introducing that criticality in relation to representation and that kind of spans ev everybody. How prominent is LGBTQ voices in our discipline? How prominent is individuals with disability or learning difference or mental health challenges? How is our profession permitting access for everybody to enjoy our discipline, engage with it and, and have it as part of their life? Or is it excluding people? And we need to do the same for our research paradigms. Academia has almost exclusively been focusing on Western paradigms and approaches to research. Indigenous research paradigms might be considered as research objects. Oh, let's go and have a look at how they think about, I don't know, spirituality or energies in Eastern underdeveloped countries, but not really accepted and respected as co-equals within Western universities. And this manifestation of ontological oppression is a result of Western science being explored, exported around the globe from Europe alongside imperialistic and colonial attitudes. So when we think about constructivism, or positivism all of these are western notions um, and they are really the only lenses through which we view scientific study um, and so really it's about taking a really critical view of that tom any other comments on the padlet uh, i think andy had one more in there of using teaching approaches that are not inherently exclusive. Uh, his example is Lego serious play. Um, Brilliant. 
yeah, it's fantastic. Different with your curriculum. Yeah, excellent. Because you can have an, you can, we can do lots of hard work on making sure our curriculums are inclusive and representative. But if the materials and the activities that we use to engage students and help them learn actually exclude a proportion of the classroom, we've wasted our time. Jim at Joe on my course I have very international students equally international staff and I've had far I've had more than one difficult conversation with colleagues being a little harsh with students from similar backgrounds to their own and not always solved by matching well that's that's possibly um, an interesting psychological process that's being observed in the classroom there yeah interesting okay so questioning yeah, I think so. I wonder if it, it's sometimes we think about internalised oppression or projection. Right. While architecture is in practice male dominated, in education it now has a balanced cohort, so more women going into practice. However, architecture in itself and the process is not gender specific. The different genders may bring something different to the expression. This is based on upon nurture, experience and, of course, culture. Yeah, and actually, if, if for somebody like me who knows nothing about buildings, I wonder if you might see different um, levels of femininity or masculinity in architectural design. But I wonder how um, whether there are still um, issues of gender pay gaps or male architects in positions of management or as firm owners rather than females. So it'd be really interesting to see how the profession develops as it becomes more and more um, gender neutral. Excellent. OK, to what extent does the content of my modules presume a particular profile mindset of the student and their orientation of the world? And what is the effect of this on student engagement? So there's some questions there which I'm hoping will give you some, I guess, kind of food for thought and be a springboard for planning your content in TB1. I've put a couple of little um, additional slides which are kind of like an add on just because I feel they're so important and I like them. So I'm trying to get them into everything I present. And the first thing is let's talk to our white students about whiteness. Um, and it, this is very sensitive and we're hoping to run in due course a series of um, Brave Space workshops. That's the name I've given them yet, although it hasn't been approved. And it, it's hoping to kind of support academic staff to manage difficult conversations in the classroom. Um, but let's talk to our students about the privilege of being white. White privilege uh, recognises the advantage that white people have and other people may not. White supremacy represents the view that white people are superior to non-white counterparts and that view I think is currently held by the President of the United States. So it's a very real phenomena. White fragility, which we may encounter in our classrooms, reflects the feelings of anger, denial or defensiveness exhibited by white people when confronted with issues of structural racism um, and racial inequality. Yes, stereotyping of culture through food experience. Yes, and I was very saddened to watch a. Um, I was very saddened to watch a presentation uh, recently where some really great work was being championed in relation to decolonising and promoting a diverse um, institutional and environment. But what had really happened was that a, a, pers a BME member of staff had been recruited to kind of tackle um, tackle the, these issues, and in some ways. Many people might argue that's fantastic and, and representative and in other ways you might argue actually it isn't really for BME people to have this burden to undo the kind of structures that they didn't create and actually it isn't appropriate to keep recruiting BME um, individuals into these roles to think about diversity and inclusion because actually um, individuals deserve to be mainstreamed as everybody else so you know how appropriate is it to keep ensuring that we recruit BME people to tackle this these gaps when actually they might be better off being a professor in English or whatever it is um, but their their claim to fame was that they had recently opened a Jamaican food court and I thought well gosh that's stereotyping of culture through food experience and I, I kind of thought that's a bit old hat but anyway that was just my thoughts on the day so upskilling your students read whiteness using ourselves as um, staff and tutor 
and lecturer and role model and person who has kind of power in the classroom, which we, we want to try and get where we can to be an ally, to be an ally to all students. And so I think I've incorporated some links here um, and just click on these links and see how can I be a really proactive, vocal uh, ally to students who identify as non-binary or to students who are a, a person uh, of from a BME group or for a student who is LGBTQ. How can I use myself, whatever my identity is, how can I use my prominence and power to, um, you know, be an ally to all of my students? And finally, upskill your students regarding microaggressions because microaggressions happen all the time from really really well-intended people who would not identify themselves as racist or discriminating it's discriminatory in any way um, but actually for individuals who experience microaggressions the cumulative effect is um, really quite painful there's a little video here one minute 50 if anyone wanted to watch it would you like to watch it now I could click on it or would you like to watch it at your leisure no. Did somebody say yes? Yes, good. Let's watch this video. I, I love this video. Is my screen sharing appropriately, Tom? So is it a, is it a video video? Oh, it's just inside a web page. Yeah, so, so it is a video, that's fine. The, the best thing to do is stop sharing the screen. Yeah. And then when you when when you go to share again. Share that one. No, uh, at the top of share content, it says optimize for text and images. If you drop yeah. that down, optimize for motion and video. Oh, I've got an installer driver for that. Uh, okay, so can you put the link to the YouTube in the chat and I can share it my end and yes do that for you if you like i will thank you sorry about this do, 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 do. It's what we've been talking about all week about appearing human to your students it doesn't matter if things go wrong it's how you handle yourself when things do eventually and <laughs> inevitably go ah i mean that's that is it's such a relief isn't it there you go you just got to open that web page, Tom, and then click play. But I know you are a member of TEL and you don't need me to tell you that. So I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, you say this, I didn't do what I told you to do. So let me do that again. Uh, share content, optimize for video, share computer audio, share. Brilliant. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you again. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? I have so, yeah. share too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Touch your hair. Multiple times a day. Can I touch it? Can I? It's fucking annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try with a challenging major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. <laughs> I don't know.
am I supposed to do this? It's not me who's fixing it. That is excellent. Right, where's my... Okay, so one mm. final thing from me, which is share my content, share my screen. Okay, if you want to think uh, further during the summer period about decolonizing, I've attached here the um, SOAS Learning and Teaching Toolkit to have a look, see if you can make any immediate enhancements. Um, and don't hesitate to contact me at all if you have any questions or you'd like to talk anything through or you'd like to get involved. I've put some decolonizing resources here for somebody to have a look at and some references and um, finish on a nice picture. So I'm going to hand you over to Tom, who is going to give us a little run through on Blackboard Ally so that um, really we can all be really clear that the materials that we are sharing with students are accessible for everybody. Because what we know is that if they're not, it's unlawful uh, and it's unethical. So we've got to make sure that we get it right. We've got the handy tool of Blackboard Ally embedded into Moodle to, to help us do just that. Even if we don't know from the outset what to do, Ally will tell us. So thank you very much. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I will share my screen. And just while I do that, um, it kind of popped in my head as you were talking about that and, and from that video as well of like, maybe you should try something easier. I, I know my mum wanted to be an engineer and was kind of like, are you sure you want to be an engineer? How about being a teacher? That's, a, that's more fitting for your stature. And it's like, okay, there you go. She's a good yes. teacher. So. I mean, that is assumptions about the, I guess, the physical profile of an engineer, Tom. And she felt that you didn't fit that stereotype. No, it wasn't me. She, I, I couldn't have been an engineer. No, she was told when she was at school. Um, uh, me, no, I definitely couldn't have been an engineer. It's also about knowing your own limits. Uh, anyway, Blackboard Ally. Um, if you log into Moodle and have uploaded uh, files to Moodle, you may have noticed uh, these little sort of icons next to, to that uploaded file. Now, uh, what they are is Blackboard Ally reports. Um, they don't appear on Moodle content uh, for the reason that if you create something in a Moodle book, for instance, it is it it will be accessible now. Obviously, if you had a hyperlink and essentially upload a file inside of that, that doesn't make that um, file that you've uploaded accessible. But within the Moodle framework of typing, adding in the, sort of the new sort of template theme uh, sty styles and designs, they are all covered and have been built with accessibility in mind. So things that you create directly within the web interface of Moodle will be accessible for things like screen readers, uh, and that kind of uh, sort of supportive technology. However, if you're working in Word, in PowerPoint, creating a PDF, you may very well see these icons. Now, what this means is the document is, for whatever reason, unaccessible. If I click on that for the, the PDF for cake, what it will do is tell me what this means. So this PDF is untagged. Luckily, there's a big button underneath that that tells me what this means and it tells me here how tags work and what I need to do to make sure that there are headings, um, there are tables, everything is clearly laid out and, and tagged accordingly. And how do I tag a PDF? It says, do you have the original and editable version of the file? I'll say, yes, I do. And it tells me what bit of software I might be using. So I'm using Microsoft Office. And it will go through and tell me uh, how to use that in Microsoft Office and what it means to do that. Um, if I go back here and do the one for uh, a set of PowerPoint slides, this presentation contains images that are missing a description. Again, what does that mean? Um, and uh, it's essentially what's called alt text. And I'll show you how to do that inside of PowerPoint in a minute. Although from what I've been Googling, my PowerPoint's broken um and how to add descriptions so again it tells you how to uh, use powerpoint for microsoft office uh, 2016 and it shows me here how to add 
a good description and what to do with it. Now, you'll notice here that this document is a green arrow or a, a green bar. So it's 86% accessible. So it could be better. Uh, there are bits missing. And I, when I was writing this, I did. Oh, there we go. It's got to the bottom. Uh, there we are. So that needed uh, that needs an image description. I thought I put it on, but obviously I hadn't saved it. So there are a few bits that it is missing um, and I could go back and make it more accessible. Now, as Katrin was talking to about it being unlawful, um, there was the a new European directive that came through about this kind of thing, um, which the UK, despite leaving the EU, have taken on board. And there is also other obscure parts within law that cover this as well. Um, and uh, as yet, no one has actually been litigated against for it that I am aware, but it does it does open us to the if a student is asking for sort of supported and, and, and relevant materials with accessibility in mind, you could be taken to court um, using that, that sort of legislation. Now, I mean, it's fair to say we're not motivated by punishment, though. We're motivated by an intrinsic desire to, for social justice. <laughs> and I was just about to get to that, which is, <laughs> which is if we make something accessible for one particular reason, actually it then becomes accessible for every particular reason. Um, so it, it is very much that kind of idea that it's not just about, uh, as Catherine says, it's not just about the money side of it, because again, like the, the directive is very... Um, open to being kind of forgiving in certain areas, but it is about making things accessible for everybody and making things useful to anyone that wants to get them, no matter what the issues they may or may not be facing. Um, and so just to let you know as well that these icons do not appear to the students. Uh, these are only available to you as the academic or essentially the lecturer online developer within in a Moodle site. The student, however, does see this which is the capital A with the arrow. And if you hover over, it says alternative formats. If I click that, I could download that PDF as a tag, uh, sorry, that Word document as a tagged PDF, a HTML web page, something for uh, an e-publisher. So if you use a Kindle or the iPad, um, electronic Braille, um, an MP3 version. Now, again, it's not like Stephen Fry reading Harry Potter. What it is, is a relatively automated Sort of vocal process of that mp3 but it is still listenable and it is still very useful to those that need it without you having to narrate every single one of your um d documents that you put in there and a beeline reader which is an, an enhanced screen reading software and obviously you can get things like within moodle the accessibility bar that allow us to change overlays and things here and with the at bar as well which will appear at the top that also has a text to speech feature in it directly in Moodle. So again, people can get different sort of levels of accessibility help within Moodle uh, as well as what Ally provides. So I see someone um, has asked about how to add something into PowerPoint and how to make it decorative. I can't show you the decorative bit directly in mind because it doesn't work. Um, however, if I insert an image, so insert a picture. And let me show you the idiots that are my children. <laughs> so there they are. You say that, you know, you see that. Very cute. Yeah, yeah. You can have them. Um, so I click on the image. Well, where, where come on, my back disappear. I have to minimise this just to get to that bit. There we go. So under here, it says picture tools and format. You can also right click and do format picture at the bottom there. So if I choose format picture, uh, within mine, I have this icon here, size and properties. Under that, and mine's already open, but you'll get these options where you can change the size and, and, and other bits and pieces, but you can also do alt text. So I can say two children dressed up uh, at the Haynes Motor museum and again in that description i can explain some more uh, 
click off, it automatically saves it. So that now has behind it in the magical stuff that PowerPoint has in the code, it has saved that alt text. So if a screen reader uses it, it will read that uh, there. To answer the question of how do I make it um, decorative, in that, same, in that same place that I have here, there should be in certain versions, so I think Office 365, there is a little box that appears that you tick that says make decorative, where you basically don't have to add alt text. That works for something like, uh, and let me open up, no, not new, open, here we go. If I open up our Friday slides here, something like this. These purple, blue boxes, grey boxes that make up the PowerPoint slide, they would be they would be decorative. Something like an actual photo would need a description. Um, arguably, there are certain <coughs> things within it where you wouldn't need to set it to be defined if it was purely just a random image on a, on a slide that isn't illustrating anything in particular. But that's where you need to make sure you have the right definition of what you're considering just a decorative image and where something may need that little bit more explanation. There are a whole load of other uh, things that, other than alt text, that you can do for accessibility. And again, I did very quickly do a Google search, uh, trying to find other bits out. But again, I just Googled um, decorative image in PowerPoint. I, get, I got this from the, the PowerPoint site. <laughs> Uh, from Microsoft and within that there is a whole load of making things accessible and again ignore that last sentence make your PowerPoints accessible to anyone uh, no I don't think it does Jim I think the I think we've had conversations with the marketing department about the current state of the UOP PowerPoint presentation um, and the inaccessibility of it uh, it is a conversation we continue to have Any other questions before we continue anywhere else? Tom, can I just come in on the PowerPoint question with the marketing PowerPoint? Yes, please do, Andy, if you know more than I do. I can't hear you. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Carry so on. I was just going to say, the, there is a simple answer to the PowerPoint one. If, you, if you're worried about it doing all the time, if you get one university PowerPoint and you bring it down, and you put your background into the slide master and alt tag everything in the background, keep that PowerPoint as your template, you've done it. And then you just come back each time to that base PowerPoint. So it's, it saves you having to worry about the branded elements uh, being accessible because you can do that yourself. Um, and then you, you create a template which you can use each time. What's a slide master, Andy? I hear people cry. Um, the slide uh, and you're going to show them, aren't you, mate? That's yeah. the idea. Uh, I'm Tom, I can never remember where it is. View, view, slide view master. master. In the slide master, what they've done is they've created. If you in, insert any particular type of slide, it has given it um, a style for the university, and that's where you would need to then go over here, right click. If it was me, Tom, I'd probably advise people to delete a lot of those because they they're just not used. A couple of basic ones and get the get the accessibility on it makes life so much easier. Yeah, but essentially there are different levels uh, when you're creating a slide from the top one, which isn't actually the first one they use, which is that one. But yes, so that is what the slide master is, and like Andy mentioned. If you tag everything in the slide master, then whenever you use it, keep that as your template, make a new PowerPoint from it and save it as a separate version. You'll always be able to go back to that one that had everything tagged and you're not having uh, to do. Uh, there you go, Jims. What is a slide master? I hope I just demonstrated that. But again, um, Google has a lot of resources on, on how to edit and manipulate slide masters. And if you have more questions after this, please do contact us and we'll try our best to help with that sort of thing as well. Um, I think existing ones, I, I don't know the legislation well enough to know, but I, like for instance, there is 
for like video with like subtitles it needs to be from september 2020 any content created uh, in video format from september needs to have the um subtitles and, and transcripts available so everything that's created before that doesn't technically need it now what we would like to do and and try and think of is going back and uh, amending some of those now i think what it will come to is that idea that some of that content will out will date when you create the new content you create it with the accessibility in mind so again uh, my colleague tom cripps and abigail lee uh, and katherine as well have worked heavily on the actual minutiae of some of the, the kind of what needs to be changed and when um what we can do is uh, um, offer sort of more advice after the conference uh kind of about that because i think that again there is that kind of i can't remember how they word it but it, it's essentially that expectation of change because it's going to be impossible to change everything from previous but essentially when you're making new edits to an old sort of um slideshow that's where you'd start to make those extra changes that you're working on in that in that case so then yeah. going on they will um hit that cap and, and jump in again tom can you pop the accessibility web page link in the chat because that web page is fantastic in terms of offering guidance to how to make sure word powerpoint pdf and moodle are accessible because ultimately, if we can create it in an accessible way first, that's much easier than then trying to undo it because Blackboard Allies flagged it up and said, hang on a minute, this is a red. But I think we're out of time now because it's two minutes past 11. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And I hope um, I hope it was a helpful, interesting session for you. Bless you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, for your excellent hosting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's very interesting. <laughs> Andy's called us Tomcat. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. That is my sister's name as well, spelt exactly like Catherine. So yes, I haven't had the had that before. Tom. <laughs> Tom, thanks so much. You're welcome, Catherine. Take care. See you later, guys. Bye.